Amen. God is good. Um, we're in a series right now called Lasting Words, and um, this today is week four, and, and we've talked about the power of our words, the power of life and death that is in our words, and, 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 it's, and it's, it's the power to, to do good or to do bad, and, 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 and words don't just get spoken and then they're gone. Words last, Amen. Words last, and, and, and some of us are still under the impact of words that have been spoken to us. And so today is about the words that we speak sometimes loosely, and, and, and it's so normal in our culture, and, and it's this word gossip. We're talking about gossip today. So I worked for a company years ago called Athena. And Afina, I think there were like 80 of us computer programmers working for Afina, and, and it was this sea of cubicles, you know what I mean? And you're working, and all of a sudden, everybody goes down to take their smoke break, and, and you go downstairs into the basement to the break room and out this particular glass door, and they had this back patio that was open, and you would get fresh air, you know, which is a little bit questionable, but you would get fresh air at the smoke break. And the reason I always wanted to go with the smokers, I didn't smoke myself, but the reason I wanted to go is because you got fresh air, and you were outside and saw the sunshine and all that kind of stuff. But you also got to hear the scuttlebutt. You also got to hear everything that was going on with everybody and what all the latest rumors were. And this couple over here was probably having an affair. And this person over here had some questionable lifestyle choices going on. And there was this guy, Brian, they would talk about. And Brian is like the most brilliant programmer at the end of the row. But Brian, we think he embezzled money at a previous job and went to jail for it. And Brian's a little shady, and we don't trust him so much. Not sure why he's here still coding, but everybody's got stories. Yes, think about your workplace. Not even getting into family yet, but like just in the workplace, let's keep it nice and easy. And that kind of scuttlebutt, that doesn't really necessarily hurt anybody. It feels kind of lighthearted, but as soon as it gets into the relationships... And the actual stuff that's happening with all of us today and our inability to fix ourselves when things go wrong, gossip takes on a special power. So you got all of that stuff that's shared at the smoke break, but then all of a sudden, Stuart doesn't get the promotion that he deserved from the boss whose name is Ravi. And, and so Stuart doesn't want to talk to Ravi, the boss, about it. He wants to talk to me, Josh Trueblood, instead. God help me. He wants me to support him, even though I can't fix the problem, yes? Because this is the way that it works. There's a sociologist back in the 1960s, and he called this the drama triangle. This is the Stephen B. Cartman 1968 drama triangle. And Stewart comes along as the victim in the triangle, and he says, poor me. And he comes to me, I'm the enabler, the next one, I'm the rescuer. He comes to me and expects me to say, let me help you. And if you're a recovering people pleaser today, that's what you're going to say every single time. Yes? And why doesn't Stuart go to Ravi? Why does he come to me instead? Because it's a drama triangle and this is the way that it works and we all know that this is the way it works. Right? We don't go there because going there to the source is hard. It's hard to go and not just confront, but to work through your issue with Ravi, who actually made the decision. And Ravi's words are, it's all your fault. It's not mine at all. And this is the way that we tend to do it. We go around and there's all kinds of things that are broken with this little way that we do broken relationships, right? Part of the reason that goes wrong is that, that the rescuer thinks that they're helping the victim because they think that the victim truly needs help and you think that you're the only rescuer, you're not. They're probably going to 30 other rescuers, right? They're building a little team, a little army of people who are kind of on their side and giving them that little emotional hit that they want from all of those rescuers to come to them. You know how this works. And, so, and some of you, you're, you're still in church and you're just giving me that smile right now like I don't know about any of this. Here's a little test for you. The next time you're in conflict with your mom, who do you call? Do you call your mom or do you call your sister? You know? Come on. Amen. 
I can't put up with mom anymore. And you just, you got to talk it out. You got, you, you, you need a rescuer right next to you who's going to help you walk through this. Are we for real yet this morning, church? Proverbs eleven thirteen says that gossip is telling someone's secret. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. So, so just look at the way the Bible is just really, really straightforward, right? Like, like a gossip, the, the gossip tells what is secret. They whisper what is secret and they betray. Like someone had information and they gave it to you. And when you shared it with somebody else, there's a betrayal in that. Isn't betray a really big word today? It's a big word. That's like Judas betraying Jesus. Betray? Really? But yeah, we are, even if it is in a tiny way, and we all feel it, especially when it's against us. Here's my personal definition for what gossip is. A gossip is telling someone something that's negative about someone who isn't there to someone else who isn't helping. Amen. And all three of those things are, are key. So the first part, what's the information? You're telling something that's negative about somebody else. Their garbage, right? Their stuff. You're telling it to somebody who isn't there, who isn't helping. Like, well, the stuff that I'm telling, the stuff I told, it was true. It can be true. Gossip can be true. It can be all true. It might not all be true. Sometimes it's a, it's a bald-faced lie, right? Sometimes it's an embellishment. Sometimes it's, it's just way bigger than what the actual thing actually was. We're going to talk about ex exaggeration later on. But sometimes it's true. It can still be gossip because it's not your truth. It's not your stuff. And you tell it about the person who isn't there because, let's be honest, if they were there, you probably wouldn't be saying it. And you're saying it to somebody who isn't helping. Now, what does that mean? It means they're not on the current medical team that is helping that person get better. So I want you to imagine an ER for a second and a patient is driven in. They're the person that just had something go wrong in their marriage or whatever it is. But they're broken and they need to be healed. That's the picture. And they get put on the table and a team of doctors goes around them. And they're the people who are actually helping this person get better. The gossipers are not. They're not part of that. Now, if you're part of it and you're really like you're really close, right? Like you're in that circle of we're the people who are actively helping this person. You've got to talk. For sure you've got to talk. But most of the time that's not us. So are you on that team or are you not? Proverbs 18, 7. I love the way this puts it. Gossip is tasty talk. The title of the sermon today is Tasty Talk. The mouths of fools are their undoing and their lips are a snare to their very lives. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. Choice morsels. I love that. So just like get that picture, that poetry picture there for a second. I love how the Bible does this, especially in the book of Proverbs. It could have just told you it was tasty, but they're like, oh no, it's like choice morsels that go all the way down. Why? Because morsels are different for all of you. For me, you go to Native Smoke in Elgin, Oklahoma, and they have these things that are called burnt ends. You ever had burnt ends before? Yeah. So I didn't understand this after first service. Some, some meat smoker people came and saw me and gave me more background on it. So I guess it's part of the brisket. It's the end of the brisket. They shave it off, and they make these little cubes of, I mean, they're heavenly smoked meat. And they cube it, right? And they cube it and they, you buy it. And I, I, I just get a couple of toothpicks on the way home and you just one at a time. And it's like candy, so much better. And you, you, eat, you don't chew it a lot. Like you just let it go down. You know what I mean? Why? Because it's not about getting full. It's not about sustenance. I mean, come on. It's, it's, about, it's about the flavor all the way down. It's just so good. 
For some of you, it's something else, but that's fine. Choice morsels, they're so tasty all the way down. Do you see what the Bible's trying to say? It's trying to say, you get into a conversation and all of a sudden juicy gossip starts. Let's be real. It tastes good. It feels good. It feels good all the way down. Like that's, that's what's trying to convey it. And, and if it tastes so good, what's the point in telling us that? He's trying to indicate to us the reason you are gossiping is because it tastes good. If it didn't taste good, you wouldn't do it. There's a reason. You're getting something, right? Like any, any uh, destructive behavior in our life, we're almost always, the, the things that we can't let go of, the things that we continue, we've got pain and we're medicating that pain. We're trying to feel better. Do you know this? You're trying, you're trying to medicate it and feel better because you've medicated it before and you felt better. And so you've gotten in this pattern of medicating that particular pain this way. And so you're medicating something with the gossip talk. It's, it's giving you something. You need to know what, it, what it's giving you today. I was at a seminar yesterday, and, and the seminar was, uh, it was, it was uh, given by Celebrate Recovery, the chapter that's at uh, Cameron Baptist here in town. And uh, Pastor Jonathan from over at Dayspring is one of the keynote speakers, a friend of mine, and, and I went to see that and to, to hear what he had to say, very, very insightful stuff. But they were talking about pornography, and why do people get stuck in pornography? And it's because they're trying to medicate something. It's because there's, there's good, and, and you got to put good in air quotes here for a second, right? Because you're like, well, no, it's bad, but I know it's bad, but there's good you feel like you're getting out of it, yes? There's stuff that feels good about it, and you kind of need to know what that is. Maybe you're an alcoholic today, and you drink too much. You're reaching for the bottle, not just for the liquid that's in it. What you want from the drink is something deeper, like you're stressed, you're in pain, you don't like to be in pain, this drink helps you escape pain because it's helped you escape pain before and escape stress. And sometimes it's comforted you in the past and you want that comfort again. And, and, and the future hits are never as good as the old hits used to be, amen? It's just the places that we get stuck. And they were trying to make the point yesterday that if you would understand what it is that you're trying to medicate and the good that you feel like you get from the hit, you can start to ask yourself, well, Jesus, how did you really design me to receive this comfort instead of this? There you go. Come on. Because this thing destroys me. God, you had a better way for me to get these same joys in life you designed me from the ground up to get joy in the right way, in a healthy way that doesn't destroy the people around me. So if I can find out what it is that I'm trying to medicate, I can go to you and say, Jesus. Amen. Come on. Gossip is tasty. What is it that we're trying to medicate with this gossip? First thing, first reason it's so tasty is because when I get gossip... I'm in the know. That's number one. When I get gossip, when I get the news, do you know what that proves to me? It proves to me that I'm in the inner ring. Like there's something that's happening out there and I'm one of the kids that's aware of the stuff and I can't wait to share it with somebody else. And the reason I can't wait to share it with somebody else is because it's going to prove to them that I am, must be in the inner ring. I was the first to know. I must be important. I must be trustworthy. I must be powerful as a person, right? I must be in relationship with all the right people because I know the scuttlebutt. It's pride. It's value. It's that I'm in a spot where I don't feel valued and I want to feel more valued. And so all of a sudden the gossip comes along and it stirs that in me. I'm important now. God has other ways for you to feel important. He has other ways to build up your value that's not like this. The next thing that it does for us is that I feel better because they're worse. If someone else's marriage breaks, as, as, as much as we put on a show that we're sad about that, there is a part of us, an ugly part of us, yes? 
is glad that we're not them. There's a part of us that feels a little bit better about our own brokenness because we're not as broken as they are. Oh, you're so quiet now, and it's so tense in the room, right? It was first service was the same exact way. There's just so much like stuff in this about human behavior, and I get it, and, and we all feel it. And I'm not, I'm not going into all of this, by the way, to like slam you guys this morning. It's just, just the human experience. It's just so normal. Like we just are this way. And, and, and some of this stuff, once you get underneath the surface, there's a little bit of ugliness underneath it. And if we just talk about it and face it a little bit, we'll, we'll find Jesus' way is better. And that's the point of it all. It's not to shame anybody or to beat on you guys. It's just there is a part of us that feels better because they're worse. And I spend all of my days feeling like a broken person. And I know how to, out of control my kids are. And I know how distant my wife and I are. And I know what a mess my career is. And I know what a mess all these things are. And it just gives me a little bit of a break from all of that feeling when someone else is broken. I know that's ugly. But realize the joy that you're getting out of this drug. The third thing that we're getting, the third thing that makes gossip so tasty is that it's a shortcut to connection. This is a tough one. Again, a lot of honesty in this one. Like, it's hard to make friends. Whew. Is anybody else having such a hard time making friends? Because I'm having a hard time making friends. And when I got friends, it's hard to go deep as friends. Because sometimes I can't think of what to say. Sometimes I don't have enough to keep the conversation going. I walk into situations and it's like, and I don't have... Like everybody is in all laughing in a circle around me. Like I wish I was that guy. Come on. Like we feel this stuff, yes? yes? And we want these connections so much and we want more of these connections because there's always somebody who's got more connections than us, even inside of our families. And it's like, I just had the conversation with this person over here and, and 10 minutes and we were off the phone and I wish that would have gone on for an hour. I wish I would have known more. I wish we would have had more to connect on. And so here's what we do. Because we feel all that desire, gossip becomes a really great shortcut to connection. It becomes stuff that we can talk about it. And so it's tasty, right? Like I want to call you up and like, let's talk about everybody and everything that they're doing wrong. It's wonderful. We got lots to talk about. And, I, and he's, again, you got to realize that because to say no to it, it's no small task. Right? To say no to it means I'm going to have to say yes to something that might be a little bit harder. I remember growing up and, and there was a comedian and they, they made a sexually charged joke in their comedy routine. And when they did, I remember my mom, who's a believer, and she was like, she was like, they did that because it's an easy laugh. Because whenever you joke about that sexual stuff or stuff that's controversial in our culture, it's an easy laugh. People will laugh because no one else talks about that stuff. But, but what she was trying to say really was the comedians that work harder and do a better job don't have to do that. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Gossip is an easy connection, and it's a false connection, and it's a connection that's bringing more destruction into your life than it is help, and that's a, that's a hard one to face. With, with all that stuff, with the, the, it being tasty, and why is it so tasty, here's the thing. To, just to face yourself and just say, Lord, there's an ache inside of me that I'm trying to heal that ache through some of these conversations that I have. And sometimes I feel guilty about the conversations after they're done. Sometimes I, I, I see the destructive potential in some of those things and I feel bad, but here's why I'm doing it. Lord, you need to meet that ache in a different way. Amen. Come on. Gossip kills your friendships. Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. Have you ever grown distant from somebody because they were gossiping about you? 
Have you ever had somebody, in, and, and again, maybe this is easier to talk about in your family or your workplace, but um, have you ever had someone where it's like you shared something and then magically within 24 hours, everybody else knew about it? And what you concluded from that is if there's ever anything that I really don't want people to know, I better not tell that person. Because we're smart. So, so you do that. And then what happens is now the deepest parts of my life, I'm not sharing with her anymore. Or I'm not sharing with him anymore. Which starts to isolate me more. And it limits our relationship, right? We're like, we're never going to go much deeper than this. Because I can't trust you with this. And I'm not going to say that out loud to them. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to slowly back away from that friend. And see, this is, the, this is the hidden destructiveness of gossip that we don't talk about in our lives. But it's happening all the time. See, our culture and our world is a broken place. And the way that we do our relationships is broken. And Jesus is the solution. That's why the scripture is coming in and talking about this topic. It's not because you're naughty when you gossip. It's not because God's got a clipboard and he's watching your every word and he's keeping track of all of your sins because he's giddy about your darkness. He's not. He wants you to be whole. And he wants your relationships to be whole. And this stuff actually matters. Gossip hurts churches. This is not scripture. This is a quote from Ray Ortland, who's a pastor and wrote a commentary on Proverbs. He said this. He says, I've never seen adultery send a whole church into meltdown. Gossip, by contrast, is often perceived as a little sin, but it destroys churches. I remember reading that quote and just being really shocked by how extreme he made that. But then it hit me. If gossip separates close friends, like the scripture says, then that means it separates families and it separates communities and it separates church families and church communities. It keeps us all at a little bit more of a shallow spot. How you doing? Everybody all right? Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to go a, a little bit deeper into how gossip specifically hurts people. Um, because I want us to see it and just face it, and then we're going to get to the good news, uh, what we can do instead, and then it's going to feel better. Um, why does gossip hurt us? Like, let's get underneath it. First off, it, it shames the person that the thing happened to or happened about. It always shames somebody. And shame is powerful. Did you know that? So you've got stuff that you've done in your past and Jesus has forgiven you for that. If you reach out to Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for those exact sins that you did in the past. And when he comes to you offering his amazing grace, what that actually means is he paid for all of those sins. You just have to say, Jesus, would you save me? And he will. And when Jesus saves you and says he separates your sins as far from you as the east is from the west, okay? He, he forgives and forgets. It's all gone. Guess who doesn't forget, people? And you? And all that not forgetting that people do and, and that you do, all that not forgetting, that's called shame, that shame is you holding on to the past and letting the past and what you've done have power over you. I know, I know God said I'm forgiven, but I just can't let it go. I just can't feel okay. That's the power of shame. Jesus wants to destroy the power of shame in your life. Yes. He didn't die for you for nothing. He died for you so you would be free. Yes. Could, you imagine giving a, could you imagine giving an incredible Christmas gift to your child and they just never opened it on, on Christmas morning? It's like some of us do that. Some of us go to God and we, we get his forgiveness and then we don't enjoy his forgiveness for the rest of our lives because we're bottled up in shame. And some of you were taught that, that staying in your shame is what somehow God wants for you. It's not. He wants you to enjoy his grace. So shame is big. When you gossip about someone, you increase their shame. You hurt their reputation. You take what they've done and you expose it to more and more people, yes? 
and that hurts them. And it doesn't just hurt them at a surface level. For many of us, that increased shame hurts our healing process that Jesus has for us. You've gotten in the way of God's healing. Don't do it. That's a lot. Second reason gossip hurts us is it destroys that friendship bond. Again, if, if, if you've learned that I tell this person detail and it goes to everybody else, I'm going to start isolating from them. I'm going to start shrinking the, the intimacy and impact of that relationship. I'm going to lose people. Number three, it always gets exaggerated because it never stays the same size, does it? It's the telephone game. If I'm going to start sharing it, it's going to get bigger, which increases what? It increases that shame again. Next, it stirs our hate for each other. And if you're anything like first service, man, I put that word hate up there, and you hate that I put that word hate up there on that slide. It stirs our hate for each other. What does that mean? Well, it's like, here's what's weird. Sometimes, like, you'll get a news headline, and it's like, oh, my gosh, right? Like, this thing happened. It was so huge. It was so dark, so destructive. And then you find out later that people investigated that more, and it wasn't so bad. Have you ever had that happen? Like, like, like the investigation was done. It was not so bad. The first thing was clickbait. You know, you clicked through the clickbait and it wasn't that big of a deal. But there's a part of you, there's this really tiny little wicked part of us that is disappointed it wasn't so bad. Come on, somebody. Like, why did I enjoy that it was that dark? Sometimes we do. Sometimes our curiosity. The enemy uses that, uses gossip to stir that desire for darkness in each other. Amen. We should want it to be smaller, guys. We should want what happens in the lives of other people to be healed, yeah. to be concealed and covered. And we should want them to be okay. We should not want things to be worse. And then the last one is, it keeps your enemies enemies. And for those of you who are leaders in the church and have been part of the church for a long time, this is something that you've seen. This is something that you need to be aware of, <clears throat> is gossip has a way of taking whoever your enemies are and keeping them right in that enemy spot. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. He said, love those who curse you, yes? Yes. Yeah. Like Jesus was all about like you target those enemies and you make them not enemies anymore. That's essentially what he's saying. But the enemy doesn't want that for us. The enemy wants the exact opposite. The, the enemy wants our broken relationships to stay broken and to get more broken. Do you know that's the way it works in this world? Everything that starts to die just dies more. Anybody? Everything is moving toward death in this world. It's, it's just the way that it works. It's part of the curse. And anything that God's truly got in his hand tends to resurrect. Have you noticed that? It tends to go from broken and dead to alive again. That is the impact of God's power and God's heart. So God wants to come into all of your broken relationships, brothers and sisters, and he wants them to be resurrected. Amen. He wants them healed. He wants them loving again. Yes. But here's what gossip does. So let's say I'm broken with you, and let's say I'm bitter toward you. Any gossip that's out there floating around about you, I'm going to magnetize that to my heart. And I'm going to believe every dark report that's ever going to go past me about you. Why? Because it confirms my feelings that you're a bad person. And it's easier to conclude that you're a bad person than to heal with you. I keep my enemies my enemies. And that happens in the church all the time. Logicians, they call it confirmation bias. So I've made this tiny decision that this is true, and then I just look for any data that might come along that confirms that it's true. Yeah, see, I knew they were a bad person all along. This is not the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. It's supposed to heal with each other. Gossip makes it worse. So how do we stop it? Here's the positives. Ready for some positive? Yeah. All right. Proverbs 20, 19 says, A gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anybody who talks too much. You're like, who's going to be left? I don't know. I really don't. 
jo- jokes. Jeez, j- just jokes. <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's so clear, isn't it? Like, like, if there are people in your life that are just talking way too much, like, avoid them. Because sometimes, like, if, if you get within reach of them, you're just going to get caught in it. You're going to be part of it. And now you're part of the problem instead of part of the solution. So simple avoidance is part of it. And you're like, how in the world do I avoid? So I'll tell you this one. Do with this what you will. Here's my strategy. So I'm a pastor, which makes me a bit like a gossip magnet. Everybody thinks I ought to know everything, which for the record, I don't. I suffer from a total lack of curiosity about most things. But people will come and they'll say, you know, I got to tell you, blah, 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 blah. Um, Have you talked to this person yet? And, And for you recovering people pleasers like me, oh, that's brutal. To say no to a gossip, oh, I mean, you're, you're nervous right now. Like you're feeling the tension in your body right now at the very thought of that, to say no. Because again, they're that victim in the triangle, right? I, I can't say no to a victim. Yes, you can. Because you're not helping them and they're not helping themselves, right? It's so tasty for them. It's tasty for you, but it's hurting so much. So to say no to them, here's my little speech that I make. So Hopefully I haven't made it to you, but here's my speech. (laughs) If someone comes to me and it's a bit of gossip, I will say, um, I want you to know before you tell me the rest of the story that I am going to tell them that I know this. I'm going to recount it to them because I've made a commitment to Jesus that I won't hold on to stories like this. I'll always tell them, and I will tell them that you're the one who told me. You've got 24 hours. You got about 24 hours to tell them. You can, you can beat me to them, but I am going to tell them. Here's, if you're a people pleaser today and that just sounds so brutal to you, I will just say this. The one upside to that conversation is you'll have it with them once and they won't come back to you again. Even in families, oh my gosh, it will shut it down. <laughs> Proverbs 17, 9. Love covers it. I love this. It says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Covers over. Love covers over. Do you see that phrase up there? If you want love, you'll cover over. See, gossip exposes. Love covers. Gossip exposes. Love covers. Gossip makes it more public. Love covers. It's a, it's a very interesting topic. Love covers. Like think Again, think about Jesus on the cross for you. He covered your sins, yes? Love covers, the New Testament says, love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. Love has this covering nature to it. It doesn't want to shame you. Love covers. Jesus covers covers. It's, it's the way that he would do it, right? Like, like the woman caught in adultery, there's that, that moment where he gets down into the dirt with her and says, go and sin no more. He says it to her after everybody else leaves, go and sin no more. Why? Because love covers. It's just, it, it keeps it individual. I don't have to blast your shame to everybody. It's not going to do any good. So love covers. Now, Before I go deeper into this, because this is the really good stuff, by the way. This is what you've waited for. Love covers. This is the way of Jesus. Love covers. There are limits to this. Some of you have heard of churches, even recently, headlines, even recently, documentaries, even recently, about churches where bad things were going on in their church leadership, and they hid stuff. They hid stuff, and they did not protect future victims of those church leaders. That's bad. Can we just be clear about that? The New Testament is very, very clear that church leaders are held to a different standard, and there are times when elders must be rebuked of their sin publicly. That's in there. Look for it. 
And sometimes churches have had a history of, because, because we're trying to protect dollars and we're trying to protect butts and seats and we're trying to protect the reputation of this church name, we might hide some things. No, no, no. The reason that's wrong is it's because it's the reputation of Jesus Christ himself that matters, not your church's reputation. Amen. Grace Fellowship is a wonderful place, and we've got a wonderful legacy in this community. But Grace Fellowship Church, the organization, is not an eternal force. And it did not die for you. Only he did. Only he is perfect, and only he is eternal. So we don't protect Grace Fellowship we love Jesus. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so don't go too far with this idea of love covers. There are limits to it. When, when, when it's obvious abuse, when there's potential victims, we have to bring things out into the light. But look at this from Genesis chapter 9, verse 21. It says, One day Noah drank some wine that he had made, and he became drunk and naked, lay naked inside of his tent. Some of you right now are like, I don't remember this from Sunday school. And now you know why. So send it, like, like you got Noah and the ark and the animals came two by two and they were cute and fluffy and colorful, yes? And there was a rainbow and all of that kind of stuff. It was all really, really good. But you get to the end of the rainbow, you get past the flood and all of a sudden this scene happens because the Bible is always honest. Sometimes it's complex, just like our families are complex. And so Noah has this moment and we don't know why he became drunk. I don't deal with any of that. He just did. And he wasn't in control, yes? Because that's sometimes what happens to us. We're not in control. And he's there naked on his bed, inside of his tent. And all of a sudden, Ham, the father of Canaan, his son, walks in, sees dad naked, and went outside and told his brothers. And that told his brothers, if you look at the original Hebrew, what it says is he told them with delight. That's the literal. He told them with delight. You'll never believe what dad's doing. You'll never believe how dad looks. This is Noah. Noah, a, a man who was righteous in his generation, who stood up for the Lord in his generation, who saved humanity in his generation, and he's having a bad moment. You ever have a really good life and have a bad moment in a really good life? And he has a bad moment. And Ham goes out there and starts joking around with the other brothers with delight. And what do the other two do? Watch the rest of this. this is blow your mind. Then Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers, took a robe and they held it up over their shoulders and they backed into the tent to cover their father. And as they did, they looked the other way so that they would not see him naked because love covers. And it's not just physical. It's emotional. Love covers. Our dad is a wonderful man, and this is a bad day for him. And love covers. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. We need to cover. This has been convicting for me this week. We had a conversation as a church staff on Wednesday I read several of these verses to them because it was already just churning inside of me. Because it's so normal. This gossip thing is so normal, yeah? And sometimes we fall into it and sometimes we don't mean to. And so we are looking at all these verses and talking about it. Even as church staff, it's like we're trying to help people and sometimes we end up going too far. Or sometimes we think that we're on the medical team trying to help this person and we really weren't. And sometimes we find ourselves being in the know about stuff that made us feel good, but it increased that person's shame over there. And we've got to start falling in love with the idea of covering each other. Because that's what Jesus does, because he wants you healed and he doesn't want shame in the way. And Linda and I were talking about this this week because sometimes I go home to her at night and I'm talking to her about things. And sometimes I need Linda Trueblood's wise counsel to speak into me about issues that I'm facing. And I find myself telling her things. 
And sometimes I'm just overwhelmed and I'm stressed and I find myself telling her things. And then in the process, there's days, there's nights that we're together and I'm like, 30 seconds ago, I probably crossed the line of what was healthy for me to say. And I shouldn't have done it. And I didn't, I didn't see it when it happened. I see it now. We, we ought to stop. And in those moments, do I stop? Do we stop? Are we sensitive about this? Because we should be. What I'm trying to say to you is that I'm a sinner when it comes to gossip. And we all are. We talked about the the week we talked about lying. It's like we are all liars at the foot of the cross. We're all gossips at the foot of the cross too. God, how do we get better? Last picture. Some of you guys know this scene. You remember that? Anybody remember that? Damar Hamlin I think I said that right. I'm not a sports person. I fake sports sometimes. But yeah, this was back in January and he did a tackle and went into cardiac arrest. Medical people are rushing the field trying to bring him back to life. and, And he's in this spot on the ground And you you know what a vulnerable moment that is. It's not his best Kodak moment, yes? And like what those cameras might see, because that's what our culture does, right? Like as soon as there's a moment, all the cameras rush in because we want to see it all. We want to post it all on social media. Like like they're all going to do whatever. And what do the teammates do? What is their instinct? Their instinct is, we got to love this guy. We can't resuscitate him. The medical professionals are on it, but we can cover him. They they physically surround the guy. They're doing this the Jesus way. Mind-blowing. And we all saw it on TV. That is how your family should look. That is how the church should look that we would cover, love covers. Would you stand? Hmm. Jesus, we're all gossips at the foot of the cross and we thank you, God, that today we're forgiven and we're not condemned. Lord, I pray that, that you would come into the way that our relationships, they, they just so often they go down into death and, and they get more and more unhealthy. God, we want to we wanna see resurrection more in our relationships. We want to see forgiveness that works. We want to see shame that gets destroyed. And God, we want that. God, we want it in our family. God, we want it in our extended family. We want it in our workplace. We want to be a light, God, wherever we are of of the way that you resurrect friendships, God. Show us how to cover. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.